SAM Media Center and this is talk show of Tochko Persona. On February the 4th, the biggest event in football will take place in Atlanta, the Super Bowl. The New England Patriots are going to face the Los Angeles Rams. Russian football fans can watch Super Bowl on big screen at the Super Bowl party, which will be visited by first ever Russian Pats player Ilya Yarashuk. <laughs> my name is Mitri Hamidulin and this is my co-host Dana Bilder. Thank you. And uh, Not alone today in our studio, we have NFL legends Ron Stone, Max Lane, and Steve Nelson. So, Ilya, welcome to Moscow. Well, thank you for having me here. <laughs> uh, let's uh, start our interview about uh, talk about the best sport in uh, in the world, which we're going to present to Russian fans: football. So, as we know, in high school you played on the wide receiver position. That's correct. Yeah, uh, and uh, which position is harder to play on, uh, wide receiver or linebacker position? Well, one of the reasons they put me at wide receiver when I first started playing American football was because um, it was what I thought the easiest position to learn. In fact, I actually started out as the kicker and the punter, okay. just because I wanted to be on the team, because I was a soccer player yeah. all my life up until that point. Then my senior year, I decided I want to try American football. It was my last opportunity in high school to play. And so um, I, I was so bored during practice because when you're a kicker, you stand around and do pretty much nothing until maybe only 10 minutes of the practice. I asked my coach, is there another position that I could possibly learn to play? And he knew that I was a track athlete as well. So he said, okay. Uh, he showed me what's called a passing tree. And the passing tree is just the routes that a receiver yeah. runs to catch the ball. And after he showed me that, he says, just memorize the numbers. Mm -hmm. It's kind of easy. The even run numbers are inside routes. The odd numbers are outside routes. And the bigger the number, the longer the route you run. And so just memorize this. There's nine of them. Okay. And, uh, and you'll be able to run and catch the ball. And so it just so happened to be that that was the easiest position to learn. So I started at wide receiver. Okay. and and got started that way. On defense, the linebackers had too many things they needed to read, to, to know, to call all the plays and the adjustments on defense, so it was too complicated for me to learn right out of the, right out of the gate. Okay, and uh, physically, is it uh, harder, to, uh, harder to tackle people or to like, try not to get tackled? Well, each one is different. I think that uh, when you have to tackle people, you have to be really physical. You, you know, you have to deliver the, the, the punishment to somebody, <laughs> which is maybe somebody will say easier than it is to run and try to catch a ball and receive a blow yeah. from somebody and continue to catch the ball. Um, so each one is, it has its own complexity. Okay. Um, so I can't really say one's easier than the other. Um, I think the linebacker has probably a lot more uh, responsibilities mentally because yeah. he has to keep the entire defense uh, uh, where they need to be. He's the defensive quarterback. He's the yeah. play caller and the adjustment responsible for all the adjustments on defense. So you really have to be almost like a coach on the field and know what's okay. going on. Yeah. So uh, as we started talking about tackling people, mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about uh, about the NFL actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a group of people who share the opinion that the league has become softer. No. Uh, so QBs are almost untouchable uh, because of the level of strictness of roughing the passer rule. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you agree with uh, with uh, the statement that uh, the league has become softer and uh, it's it's not as uh, fun to watch as it was in 90s and 80s? Well, I think if you ask most league officials, the word softer, they're, they're going to kind of frown upon. I yeah. think they're going to say, they're going to try to use the word safer. Mm -hmm. um, there has been a lot of um, evidence that have come forward that some of these concussive level hits yeah. are affecting the health of players in their in their later years and so what they're trying to do is to minimize the amount of unnecessary contact yeah. to keep the game as exciting and to have contact but to eliminate something that's going to create crippled people in their later years uh, so they're trying to eliminate things that are <clears throat> probably something that's not more not natural for the body and to eliminate the amount of uh, <clears throat> eliminate the amount of hits that people take in practice, for example. Okay. 
So during practice, if you don't practice the contact, then essentially you start to lose the skill of how to deliver the contact or accept the contact. So sometimes you know, the players maybe not, are not as good at tackling yep. or not as good uh, at some of the blocking that we used to do earlier when we played. We were not softer or safer when I yeah. played in my day. So this is a long time ago. You have to remember, I played uh, probably close to 30 years ago now. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Because uh, I've asked uh, this question because, uh, like, this year Clay Matthews got a uh, flag thrown on him mm -hmm. for uh, actually, like, nothing. As for I remember. falling on the court. Yes, yes, you're, you remember that moment yes. probably, yeah. and you guys too. Yeah. Uh, do you think that uh, referee should, uh, should have called the foul there? No, I don't think. I. You know, if he was going to do something aggressively or intentionally to injure the quarterback, but he had no other way. I mean, when you're approaching and trying to knock somebody down and the momentum of your body is moving forward and you're making contact and you land on top of him, there's no other way you can do that. Yeah. I mean, you're all students, I think, here at a university and yep. you study physics. How do you knock somebody down running full speed at him and don't end up on top of him? It's yeah, just not of possible. Of course. So I don't think that should have been a flag. Yeah, actually, no way you can avoid it. I agree with you totally, mm -hmm. uh, even though... Uh, uh, Patriots uh, got, uh, got a f uh, the same uh, the same call uh, during the uh, conference uh, fin uh, final, but I, st I still agree with that moment. Well, uh, even that call, just yeah. from my point of view, you're talking about the uh, Tom Brady, the hit on Tom yes, Brady, yes, Tom Brady when, hit, they, yeah. when they swung the arm and, yep. and looked like from the referee who was standing behind him that he may have hit him in the head or yep. the face, and he, he missed them essentially. Yes. That was a that was a blown call. That should have not happened. Yeah, I agree you with know. you. So uh, you've said that you started playing uh, professionally. 30 years ago mm -hmm. and that's why I want to ask you about the NFL draft mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, to be drafted is a dream by any football player and uh, what did you feel when you found out that you were drafted well it was very exciting I went to a university where football was not a very big sport mm -hmm. there it was University of New Hampshire, Hampshire. Someone yeah and uh, it was uh, mostly a hockey school they played a lot of hockey up there it was a, a lower level division uh, for football and um, I had actually had an injury my senior year. I had torn my bicep tendon off of my bone and it, my, my muscle rolled up into my shoulder my senior yep. year. I never finished playing my last year. So I had to return my, from an injury and thought that my career playing football was over. I didn't think I was going to make it because I was from a smaller school and then I had an injury as well as uh, on top of that. But um, I worked really hard to try to get myself in the best possible shape that I could. Uh, I did get invited to what's called the NFL Combine. Uh, and the NFL Combine is where they invite, uh, I think there's about, I think there was two to three hundred of us to, uh, to a, an event where they w look at all the different skills that you need as a football player. It's like player. an open training it's for an, it's a, a It's a tryout to see how, f what physical gifts you have and so the coaches can evaluate you and, and see if they may want to draft you. And so I did pretty well at the Combine and uh, when draft day came, at the University of New Hampshire, there were not a lot of players ever drafted in the history yeah. of the school. So at that time, they didn't have it like they do now, where they, they have a, it's a major, major event. It's almost Hollywood now, the way they set it yes, up. You can see, like, they yes, set the exactly. They, they have it's, it's stages, it's, it's television coverage. And they, back then, in those days, ESPN was just starting as a broadcasting uh, uh, company. And they would only broadcast the first three rounds of the draft, and it went pretty and quickly. You, and you were drafted in the fifth round. And I was so. drafted in the fifth round. So I remember it. We were sitting in my university. Uh, in my, uh, we had a uh, condominium that we were renting, as, as, and uh, all my friends were coming over. Mm -hmm. As tradition is uh, around football events, we got a big, a big bucket of beer, you know, yeah. a keg of beer. <laughs> And uh, we, everybody was coming in, having a, a couple of beers, sitting, watching the ESPN rounds go by to the third round. Well, the third round passed, I wasn't drafted. And by that time, starting at that time, they started at 8 o'clock or so in the morning. By 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the show was over from ESPN, yep. and the rest of the draft rounds were happening just by phone call. Yep. So everybody was getting a little too much beer, and at that time, you know, by the end of the day, everybody was getting tired, everybody was falling asleep on the floor in our, in our condominium, and I remember myself even going, laying downstairs in yeah. my room, and then all of a sudden, the, the phone rang, and it was, at that time, uh, a gentleman named Larry Wilson from the St. Louis Cardinals, when they had a team there. He had called me up and said, you know, congratulations, you've just been drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals. And then when I came upstairs, everybody heard the phone call, and they're all like looking at me, like, did something happen? And I just said, I guess I'm going to St. Louis. Yeah. And the entire room just tackled me, 
uh, they threw me on the, I remember that there was a kitchen table there and they all tackled me on the table and the table broke and the table went to the floor and everybody was on top of me and everybody was just celebrating. They just were getting you ready for the NFL. Well, yeah, I, and, I, and I was like, I was, I'm going to get injured before I even get there, you know, just because of all my friends jumping on top of me. But it was a big party that yeah, night, it, you know, it was a big imagine. university because it never really happened there. So I was excited. Yes, it was a wonderful news. Yeah, can't imagine. You guys, did you have any pre-game routine? I mean, did you have any rituals prior to the game? Uh, let's start with you, Ron. Yes, microphone. Yes, please. Uh, I think I just try to, you know, take the same route I did every day from practice. I try to make everything the same. And, you know, I, I was one who joked around a lot uh, in, uh, before the game. I wasn't the one who sat and was serious for three hours before the game started. I was more of a jokester. I had to have fun <laughs> before the game. It was too much pressure to just have a yeah, aggressive yeah, attitude to get ready for a game. So I had to joke around, you know, throw things at guys, stay loose before the game started. So that was my thing. So I understand you were a jo uh, joker, yes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Steven, what about you? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having us here. But um, I really can't. Uh, I played so long ago, I can't remember one. <laughs> no, I um, I used to get to the stadium early on Sunday, and um, you know I was a signal caller on defense, so I had different kind of a little more added responsibilities, much like Ely had. So, but I I, I knew and I was confident if I had a good week of practice, I, I felt really good coming into the you know playing on Sunday. If I had a bad week of practice and there was some questions I had, uh, you know, I tried to do last minute things which never work. And, uh, but I really never had anything, uh, you know, back, but before, you know, a lot of my teammates at that time uh, would, were always trying to get an edge. That's one thing football players always try to do. You try to get an edge. So there's a lot of pills and a lot of things like mm -hmm. that that were, you know, players were taking at the time. I never did personally, um, but uh, they, they all had their little thing, but now, I really, I really just try to concentrate on what you know, what my responsibilities and assignments were for the game, and I wasn't really nervous at all. And what about you, Max? Were oh. you nervous? Oh the yeah, game? I was nervous every game. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I would. Uh, sorry. Hey, how y'all doing? <laughs> I would uh, go for a walk around the field uh, to go out into the stadium and go see if I could see the guys that I was going to play against that were on the other team that would walk around the field also. And it kind of, you go there to check out the surface of the, you know, if we, back then there was a lot of like natural grass surfaces. So you want to go check out the grass, go figure out what you're playing on. And then also kind of see who you're going to play against if they're out there walking around. And then right before the game, like Ron and I were offensive linemen. So we were, we would block for the running backs and for the quarterbacks. And we'd have to use our hands a lot and punch. Mm -hmm. And so I would, uh, Go, go near a wall, and I would punch the wall like that to try to loosen up my wrist. Now, whether it really did it, um, it was more of a superstition thing. Like, mm -hmm. I just felt like I needed to do that to get, to get ready for the game. And what was uh, the tower, uh, uh, what team was the toughest uh, to play against for the you? The toughest to play against? Yes. Uh, well, we had like back then, and we had divisions. In New England's division, we had a team, uh, the Buffalo Bills, mm -hmm. and they were really good back in the '90s. And you would go against. Sometimes you would go against the same guys. You know, you play them twice a year, and you would go against the same guys. So it was hard to play against that guy twice in a year because he knew you, I and mean, you knew him really well, and you knew how to prepare. You would prepare for each other, and then have to. Um, you know, go to that next game. And so you didn't want to that first time you played him that season. Was it easier for you to play with the, against the person you already know? Say what? Was it easier to play with the person you've already known? It, it was from a standpoint, a little bit from preparation-wise, but physically in mm -hmm. the game, he knew like how, you know, like, like how you played. So he would combat the way you played physically. And uh, it made it tough. I mean, I mean, there were guys that I had. There was a guy named, from Buffalo, Phil Hanson, was the guy that I played against. And, and he knew me. I knew him. And it, and it was a war every, you know, every game. 
and uh, you know there were there were lots of other guys that were that were like that too. Thank you. Thank you. So now uh, let's have a small break and uh, test your guys' football knowledge. And uh, so on this screen, our football knowledge or their football knowledge? <laughs> no, <laughs> yours. <laughs> I, I guess uh, all, uh, all of the guys in the auditorium know everything about football, but uh, let's find out what you know. So, on this screen you will see uh, questions about the NFL, and you have to try to give the answers to all of them. So, the first question... Oh, okay, hold on. Uh, which team has four Super Bowl appearances, but one only in one of them? So, is it Buffalo Bills from AFC East, as you said, Los Angeles Rams, or Indianapolis Colts? Thanks, Colts. Colts. Colts, your version? Colts. Okay, Ilya? I can't go against my group. I have Colts. <laughs> okay, and the answer is? The Rams. The Rams. Oh, yes. Who yes. are playing this year against New England Patriots? Yes. The Rams were the four times? I, 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 I was shocked to be honest. Oh, St. Louis. That's right. Uh, that's right. The next question Can you call by names all members of the Russian front? Ilya, you're one not answering it. All right. One of them is Ilya. So, guys, any predictions? You can just uh, hey, take hey, a guess. Take no a guess. <laughs> number, you're, you're taking the uh, the variant. Taking number eight. Okay. Whoa. Okay. And <laughs> you're that right. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. So again, question for all of you guys: Who, uh, who was the first pick of the two, uh, 2016 NFL Draft? Was it Miles Garrett, Carson Wentz, or Jared Goff? Not Wentz. Wentz was number two guy. I think it was Goff. Golf. Your version is golf, yeah. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Which player has has led the NFL in sacks this season? No, it has to be Donald. <laughs> no, it's Donald. It's gonna be. A, they, they can't stop the guy. So you think that is Donald? Yeah. Yes, and you see. Donald. Yeah. Okay. Can we see the answer? Yes. Yes. And the last question is about Patriots, actually. Who led the Patriots in, the, in receptions this season? Was it Julian Edelman, Gronk, or James White? Was it White or Edelman? White. Was it White or Edelman? So, Ilya is going to uh, make your final decision, so, yeah. White. White. Edelman was out the first four games, so I'm going to go with White. You're right. <laughs> okay, and it's running back James White. Yeah. You're right, guys. He didn't play. He didn't play the, Edelman didn't play the first four you games. You made it really good, guys. So, so you yeah. only made one mistake about the Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles Rams. But we don't know it's anything right. about the Los it's Angeles right. Rams. We don't care about them. <laughs> yeah, we don't. So, so yeah. yeah, talking about Patriots. Uh, Ron, uh, you were born and raised in Boston. Were you a fan of Patriots? Oh, can you pass the microphone? Yes, please, microphone. Uh, I really wasn't a fan of the Patriots, <laughs> but... Uh, when I stopped playing fantasy football, I became a fan because Tom Brady was my quarterback. Yes. So and I became a fan. And what did you feel when you when what? played against? Uh, we practiced against them uh, with the Giants, but we really did not play the Patriots. I haven't played the Patriots. Never? No, just uh, in a practice. Preseason? Preseason. Mm -hmm. Preseason. We played them every year when I was with the really Giants, but... No. Right. Max, uh, Max, for your question, yes. In 2000, you were in the same roster with Tom Brady, uh, who was uh, unknown to anyone, and now he is the greatest QB of all time. What was he like in his uh, first years uh, uh, in well, the like, NFL? Like I was with him his rookie year, and I always tell people that he got me Gatorade okay. at, uh, <laughs> at, during practice. So, um, you know, he was a, a humble guy. And, uh, you know, he, a lot of times whenever, like, he was a third-string quarterback coming in as a rookie, and a lot of times those guys, either third or fourth-string lower-round draft picks, he was a six-round draft pick, um, you don't know if they're going to be around. There could be camp, they, they call them camp bodies, training camp bodies, which means that they're just around to take reps to, you know, against the starters. But 
this guy had something different. You could see definitely that he was there, uh, you know, was serious, you know, had confidence, but not arrogance. Mm -hmm. And uh, that there was just something a little bit different about him. Now, you couldn't have seen what he became, you know, way back then, but there was, uh, there was definitely something different about him for sure. Thank you. So you felt uh, that he's going to be great the second that he stepped on the no, new... He just knew that he was going to be, he, was, he would make the team and he was going to be around for a little while. Like to predict the greatness yeah, that he course. has become, nobody predicted that. I mean, that was, um, that would have been too hard to predict. Yeah, but, but just being, you know, somebody that was a little bit different than your regular guy that came in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Steve. Uh, after your retirement, you've become a football analyst. And uh, what's harder for you, to analyze the game on or off the field? It's much easier when you're not playing. <laughs> you know, but the only problem I had really was I, I, wouldn't, I had a problem being very critical of players. Because you'll hear oftentimes in broadcasts where, where, tell, where the announcers will criticize the player. Well, they really don't understand the scheme and, and the responsibility and all the different things that you know could have could have happened. Uh, so when you when you oftentimes unless it's very obvious, uh, there's some things when bad plays happen. Typically, uh, there's a breakdown, and sometimes a guy who's trying to uh, you know help his teammate out may look like the guy who's missing his assignment, but it's not true. So it's it's I was very very cautious. Uh, to try to not criticize players because I didn't know what their assignments were. I didn't know what was in their head. You know, I, and, and unless, like I said, it was very obvious. Uh, but it was much easier. To, it, was, it was much easier to, uh, to play. I mean, I, I loved playing. You know, I, I did other stuff just to, you know, for a job. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, it was much. Uh, the preparation was much easier to, to analyze. But my real love was was the game, to play it. I get it. Thank you. Now I guess uh, uh, people in the studio want, uh, want to ask some questions. And uh, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yuri. And uh, Ilya, you have touched upon the later years of the players after the games. Mm -hmm. uh, and my question is about the during and the after. Uh, it is concerning the violence uh, that is practically necessary in the game. So I would like to ask if the violence during the games begets violence in day-to-day -day lives of the players and in the later years. Thank you. Well, you know, there is over, I don't know how many there are now, but there's about a thousand, when I played about a thousand six hundred players in the league. And when you have that many people, you're going to get some people that, you, you take a you know, collection of those people that are very, very, um, you know, aggressive, athletic, and that type of thing, you're going to get some that are going to be bad apples, as we call them. They're going to maybe try to not follow the rules of, of life afterwards or even at home. And those are the ones that make all the news. And it's unfortunate for the other, there's, you know, 10 guys make the headlines for something bad they did, but what about the other 1,590 guys who are family people, who love their wives and take care of them and raise their children. And, they're, and, they're, and I knew a lot of good guys, you know, even though they played aggressively, uh, we left the aggression on the field. And in fact, if we had something that was bothering us at home or, you know, in life, we brought it and we, we brought it to the field and then left it on the field. And then when we went home, we lived normal lives. Some guys, unfortunately, couldn't turn it off and they got all the press. And as a result, people start to think, well, that's just the way football players are. They're just that way. But I can tell you, uh, I've had many friends uh, in the, on my, all the teams that I had the fortune to, to play with, and many of them are, you know, go on later after their careers to serve their communities. Um, they, they work with children and with camps and help uh, kids who have addiction problems and everything else. And unfortunately, that doesn't get the press as much as the 10 guys that go on and do something stupid. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just to add something that I don't think any player wants to hurt another player. I mean, when there's an injury, a serious injury on the field, and, and you've been a part of that, you know, that action, you, you don't, you, 
hope they're all right. You know, you pray that they recover, and because it's their their job, and they've got to support their family too. So it's a uh, you know, all the players are very, very uh, cognizant of, of injuries and, and how serious they are for a guy's career. Yeah, of course. So, any other questions? I, yeah. Good evening. My name is Victoria, and uh, this is a question from an amateur. Why soccer is more popular uh, than American football? I think it's because that has been around perhaps longer. Uh, doesn't, and, I, and I honestly believe also it doesn't require as much equipment. Think about all the uh, countries in the world that don't have the resources to buy helmets, shoulder pads, an outfit, you know, everything that you need to protect yourself in the game. What do you need to play soccer? It's a simple game. You need a ball, and in some countries they don't even play with a ball. They'll have something they can kick around, and then you just need two goals. So because of that, you know, it's a game that can be played in South America and Africa and everywhere else, much underdeveloped countries, and it's very simple, and it be grew as a result to become the world game because it's very simple. American football is a very complicated uh, game, and it involves a lot of equipment and so forth, and it just, you know, it, it takes a while for people to absorb all of that. And, and because of that, I think it's just, so, it, but it's gaining popularity. I think American football, you know, look, we're here, in Russia for the Super Bowl. Who would have ever dreamed that that would have ever happened? So to what degree it becomes popular, who knows? I think that the Russians specifically will enjoy American football because they'll see it as chess on the field. Once you realize how the game is played and it's all about creating the mismatches between the different uh, figures that you have, you know, Julian Edelman is a little guy, and then you have somebody like Ron Size. How do they play the same game, you know? And yet, it's because they have different jobs, and each one of those chess pieces on that field, the coach and trainer design plays to have certain uh, results to take advantage and score against the other team. It's a very cerebral game. And then I think that once people start to understand that strategy, they can appreciate not only the physicalness and the athleticism of the game, but also that that mental matchup between the two minds, between the two coaches who are spending the entire week, or in the Super Bowl, two weeks, preparing for each other to play that physical chess game on the field. Personally, uh, before starting our next block of questions, I would uh, like to add that I used to play soccer for uh, lots, of, uh, lots of years in my life. And when I started playing football, I understood how hard it is uh, just to play and just to understand the game. So I think that's uh, actually the uh, biggest answer for uh, the question that Victoria asked because mm -hmm. uh, like it's it's really hard to understand it from the first time but when you watch and play you understand everything so uh, let's finish with football and move on uh, to politics if you don't oh. mind uh, and kind of politics so uh, you were born in Russian family and you have Russian roots yes and uh, what mentality you feel being more native to you Russian or American and uh, how uh, how big do you think uh, the difference are between us Russians and Americans. To me, being Russian and American, it's kind of like having one as your mother and one as your father. And to say which one you love more, how can you answer that question? Do you love your mother more or your father more? You love them both. Yeah. And so to me, my cultural traditions, what I was raised in, because both my parents were Russian, you know, my heritage, you know, as all, it's Russian inside of me. And I think that my colleagues who traveled with me through this country so far to this date will agree, they see that that's pouring out of my soul. Yeah. You know, it's my, it's my faith too. You know, I'm Russian Orthodox Christian as well, and that pours out as well. But at the same time, you know, we grew up in America and there's many, many wonderful American traditions and I met many wonderful, wonderful American people. Um, and it's a kind of land of opportunity. My parents came over when, when they left this country, they're forced to leave this country. When they came over there, they had nothing. They carried off the boat what they owned. And you can carry what you own on your back, and then within the matter of one generation or two, you know, we're, our kids and myself all have college educations. We have, you know, good uh, jobs, and we're, we're contributing citizens in a society, and, you know, and that's po a possibility there. So I have to be thankful, and I love that too. In terms of what's happening between the two countries right now, I think it's very sad. Yeah. And, and, and if I could do anything, if I could contribute to anything, it would be to bring them two of them together. Do you realize what's capable in the world that the two biggest powers in the world got together and applied their talent and their skill towards solving problems rather than creating them? Yeah. It would be like 
what I see right now happening is what any child would experience when they see their father and mother fighting and talking about divorce. And then and as a child, what do you want to do? You want to bring mom and dad together and you want to see them get along. And that's what I, I feel like when I look at politics in today's day. Yeah, got it. So, um, talking about America, Americans and Russians again. Uh, so, as we all know, there was a Cold War in uh, 70s, 80s. And uh, do you meet uh, the manifestations of the Cold War in uh, attitude right now? Well, the Cold War has kind of returned, as they say, yeah. in our country. It existed when I was a child growing up. In fact, uh, when I was in basically just got into school in, in, in first grade, second grade. I remember we used to have air raid drills where there would be a siren that would go off and you'd have to go and, and put, go under a desk or in a, in a hallway and take shelter. And you had these drills that you had to do because there was this fear that somehow there would be an attack, a nuclear or missile attack, and we had to protect ourselves. And you all, always As, were ready for the war. Yeah, we were all ready at yeah. that age, way back then. And this yeah. is when I was young, you know, uh, maybe about five, six years old or so, when we started going to school. Then there was a period of time where that kind of went away. They stopped doing that because the relationships between the two countries has started to become better and that was not necessary anymore. Eventually it completely went away and there was even, it looked like it was going to prosper and, you know, they started to kind of work together and things were going very, very well. And then all of a sudden now, it, it, the, the rhetoric, the, the, the discussions are coming back towards, you know, going back to something like that. I don't know why any, anybody would want to return yeah. to that point where you are going to have children, and do you want your children learning that they have to go run in the hallway and sit, how to sit under a desk and where you go? And who wants to go back to those times? I certainly would yes, not be a proponent of that. crazy people. It, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's, the human race destroying itself. Yeah. You know, we're, we're at a stage of our, of our existence right now with the technology and the equipment and military arsenals and everything that they have. If something like this ever happens, yeah. God forbid, you know, it, it's going to be a scary world to live in and what, whoever survives there. I wouldn't Hopefully even want to live in that world of surviving something like that. Hopefully we're not coming back. Hopefully uh, not. And, uh, but, you know, let's all pray for that. Let's, yeah. let's, let's the people, in, you know, we have good people in our country, you know, they live in the heartland of America who don't want this, trust me. And there are, no, there, you, you young people and, and the people in this country, as I meet them, would never want that as well. And at some point, I'm just hoping that the people who are running these countries, you know, listen to all of us and try to do good and serve us, which is what governments should do. They should serve the people. And I don't think any people would want this. Uh, talking about American government and uh, talking about uh, people, uh, human rights. So you're, of course, uh, aware of Colin Kaepernick scandal. Yeah. And uh, for anybody who doesn't know, so there is a quarterback, Colin Kaepernick, who... Uh, the scandal is not the... his hairstyle, by the way. Okay? That's <laughs> yeah, not, his that's hair that's not the there. scandal. <laughs> so he took a knee during the national anthem. And uh, because of that, as in my, my point of view, he doesn't have a contract right now. But uh, do you think that the reason that he's not in the NFL right now is not due to this, uh, to his uh, poor physical form, but uh, to Donald Trump's uh, probable pressure, White House pressure? It's a tough question because, you know, Colin also, if, I think if he had a certain le level, if he was a really, really good player, I think they would have probably looked at his situation a little differently. So it might not necessarily be all politically yeah. related as to whether he's playing or not. Um, I do personally think that, you know, when you come from a country and your, uh, your anthem is a symbol that's Expre uh, expressed before the games and it's a tradition to sing your anthem and to honor the people who fought to give you the right to even play the game on the field mm -hmm. I think it's important to sort of respect that anthem and to and to salute it you know I you know I did so myself uh, you know as a player and, and all the players that, that were with me no matter what their background was I understand he has certain social issues that he wanted to bring awareness to I think there are other venues and other ways of doing that to get attention to to that, and I think it's just an unfortunate situation. I don't think he thought the whole thing through when, he, when it kind of all started. And like most things, it starts out as something small that wasn't quite thought out about how it's going to be a small snowball and eventually roll yeah. and become a bigger issue than it was. And I think it rolled into something for him, unfortunately, that may have even affected uh, his, his chance to come back and play. I don't think it's the only reason, 
but I think it may have been a contributing reason. And uh, what about you guys, uh, Max? What do you think about the uh, Kaepernick situation? Uh, I, I agree with Ilya. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a short answer. And Ron, Ron, what about you? What, uh, what do you think? Say, he, he, microphone, he microphone. Oh, yeah, I'm microphone. sorry. Microphone. Microphone. He, he hit it on the nose right there. I mean, it's the same situation. Okay, I mean, and Steve? Diddle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I guess uh, there are other qu questions in the order, so yeah, you please. Hi, my name is Simon. So relationship with the coach is very important for the athlete. How close were you with your first coach? My first coach? Yeah. Well, I was, you can, if you, if you want to know my relationship with my coach, ironically, my first season in New England, there's my coach right there. Actually, Steve Nelson was my linebacker coach. So, oh. you know, I had, a, I had the privilege of working with a, with, with a Hall of Famer for the New England Patriots. He's a New England Patriot Hall of Fame linebacker. So him and I had a, a, a great relationship. I respected his knowledge of the game. I tried to work as, as hard as I could to make him happy. Uh, the coach to me was always a, a big brother, or, a, or in some cases, if I had some other coaches, they were almost like fatherly figures to me. And, and, and I think it's important that you love and, you know, them because you're going to work harder for somebody you love rather than just working it as a job. When your heart is into something, you're going to perform that much better. It's got to you got to be passionate about what you do. So if you have a good relationship with your coach, you're just going to be that, trying that much harder for him. Okay, thanks. Okay, any uh, questions? Yeah. You please. Hi, my name is Polina. Uh, so, as far as I know, uh, your mom wasn't such a fan of your idea to join the league to become a player. So, and um, who did she want you to become? As, a, as an athlete, it, w it was like you're going back to my high school days when the first time I started playing American football, we had to actually trick my mother. Uh, she didn't know that we were going to play football that year. What happened was I was in my last year of school. school. I was a, a junior going into my senior year, my last year, 12th grade in, in, is it in America. My brother uh, Vasily, who was the, uh, my second brother, was going into 10th grade, and my youngest brother Alexander was going into uh, ninth grade, the, the first year of high school. So each one of us was... In, at a different level of football in our school system. Myself playing on the highest level of the school called varsity. My brother Vasily was looking at the junior varsity level and my brother Alexander was looking at the freshman level which is the first entry level in the high school at, at, for the team uh, to play. And uh, it was really my youngest brother that put the most pressure. He said, I'm gonna play no matter what. I'm not gonna even tell my parents. I'm going. And then so then Vasily jumped on his back and says, me too. And I was kind of like, uh, the, you guys r really think we're going to get away with this, you know, because mother is really against it. She thought it was a very physical game and wouldn't allow it. And so finally we approached our father and we said to him, we said, and that my angle with him was, Papa, this is my last opportunity to play this American game because you really can't play and just join a college team. That's very difficult to do. You have to start at the, the lower school level. And if, you don't, if I don't do this now, I'll never have this experience, and I'll go through life thinking, what if I tried? I, don't, I, I wouldn't know what this was like. So he kind of listened to me, and then I added, and maybe I can even get a scholarship to go play in college, and then you know, my education will be paid for. Then he kind of thought about it some more. Okay, go play, but don't tell your mother. <laughs> so we started playing, and my first game, I had the, a fortune that I had good success in the game where I scored all the team's points because I was not only the wide receiver that caught all the touchdown passes, but I kicked all the field goals and extra points. So the whole, we beat a team we had never beaten before. And the newspaper wrote an article about my, my game. And my mother went to work, and then sitting at work, all of a sudden, all the ladies in the office are bringing her the newspaper and putting it in front of her <laughs> and saying, look at Irina, your son is a hero. And she's like, what did he do? And she's like, look, he's a great football. And then she sees the picture and the article, and she's reading it. And she's like, I don't know whether to be happy or angry, you know, because they, they, pull, you know, they pull this off underneath my, my eyes. I didn't, I didn't see this. So she kind of came home, and she's like, you know, a little bit like this, but she didn't go to any of my games 
until the very last one where I said, Mama, this is what they call senior night. This is the last game of your high school where they honor the parents. And so she went to that game with my father, watched it. And then after that, you know, she saw it and then kind of liked it. After that, I started playing in college and my brothers continued to play and they played in college, the Russian yeah. front. Yeah. came to be when we all went to the same college. She started going to all the games, and now, even though none of us are playing, she still watches football <laughs> once in a while with my father, you know, and we're not even on the field anymore. So she kind of came full circle, but it, it was uh, initially she kind of said, nah, -uh, no way. I don't want my, my little boy getting hurt. <laughs> okay. So uh, you said about, uh, you mentioned your mother, you mentioned your father or your brothers, and let's talk about your personal life, your family. And the uh, first thing I want to know, if uh, you've, uh, you've said uh, in your interview, first and goal, which we, uh, we referred to, that your childhood uh, was spent in the Holy Trinity Monastery. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your favorite childhood memory rela related to this place? My favorite childhood memory with this place was the holiness of the place. There were unique people that were the monks at that monastery, yeah. and they came you know, from, from Russia. Uh, at that time, as you know, uh, there was a you know, communist regime here didn't allow the freedom of religion uh, to be practiced. So as a result, these monks left the country and they started a printing press at that, at that monastery uh, making books, religious books, Bibles and religious publications and distributing them through the entire world uh, for people who left, had to leave the country to be able to practice their Orthodox Christian faith and to continue to learn about it. Because in this country, books were being burned or they were illegal to distribute. And so I looked at the passion and the commitment that these kind of people had towards their faith, uh, towards working hard. I mean, they built a monastery when they had nothing. They came over the same way they, with just whatever they carried over with them. And, and all of a sudden, you see this cathedral come up. And then the iconography in the cathedral. And then the, the corpus. Of the, of the seminary that was built there and everything else that was built there. And you just sit there and you scratch your head and you go, is it this not the grace of God building this place? I mean, because they don't have any means. How does something like this come out of nothing? And so when you meet the kind of people and, and the legends that they all were, um, they had a drastic, obviously, an impact on my life, you know, as a child. And uh, right now you're teaching uh, children in the yes. monastery as we know. And uh, why do you like to work with them? Are you trying to like uh, give them uh, the wholeness you, you have in, in your, your uh, the faith you have in your, uh, in, inside you right now? I think that I'm trying to pass along the same tradition that was passed along to me. I had the privilege of those particular monks that I talked to mm -hmm. influencing my life and teaching me. And I see the good that you know, when you follow these laws, these laws of God, they're good laws. And I think that if the people put them into their hearts and lived by them, we wouldn't have the political problems and all of the other problems we'd have because people would learn how to put other people before yourself. Yeah. If people lived by that rule that you know, the pursuit of material wealth and fame and fortune as being me, myself, and I, number one, then of course, uh, if people live by that way, then it creates problems. But when you start to humble yourself and you help other people, and that's what those things, I want to tr translate all those teachings onto the okay. kids. Got it. And uh, you and your brothers, mm -hmm. you guys, uh, as we can see, yeah. you had problems in, uh, you had the concerts in Russia, I'm sorry. We did. And uh, how did it happen? How, like, you d you've decided that you want uh, to do it? Do well, it. when we were growing up, part of the Russian tradition is the Russian soul sings, they always say. And so we, when we were young children growing up, uh, my father was a deacon in the church, yeah. so he had a very good voice. And um, you know, he used to sing a lot too. And uh, it was part of the Russian tradition to get together and sing campfire type songs yeah. in a traditional Russian songs. And, you, and we learned all the Russian music, all the composers. And, and of course, the churches are also a cappella. They all sing in the, in, the, in the church choirs. There's no musical organs or any kind of instruments. Everything is done by voice. So as a very young age, because I was in the church, once I was too old to be an altar boy, yeah. uh, I kind of you know, went to the choir. And then I started singing there. And uh, you know, I had some success at it where you know, the different 
directors eventually recruited myself and my brother Vasily, who I see over here on the yeah. left side, singing tenor, uh, you know, into the choir. And we were here in uh, Moscow for the 450 year anniversary of St. Basil's Cathedral. They had choirs from all around the world coming and giving concerts, uh, kind of a choir convention of sorts. So we eventually came and, and you know, and okay. performed in the uh, Museum of uh, History, the Historic okay. Museum in the Red Square. Okay. And uh, now, in the end of our interview, we have mm -hmm. a tradition, it's called Blitz. And uh, basically, we're asking you a short question and you have to give us a short okay. answer. So, this year's best player or MVP? It has to be the uh, Mahomes, the quarterback yeah, for the, the uh, yeah. you know, for the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, he came on the scene and I think every coach just feared, how are we going to stop this guy? He was a wrecking machine. Talking about quarterbacks, uh, Tom Brady or Joe Montana, who are you going to pick? Tom Brady. Uh, do you have any sort of lucky charm? I, my cross. Okay. Um, to be selected first overall or uh, to win a Super Bowl? Ooh, I'm going to say win a Super Bowl. I get to share that with my team. Okay. And uh, the last question for all of you guys, uh, one by one. First, Ilya, who is going to win the Super Bowl this year? Prediction. Of course, the Patriots are going to win. Okay, Max. Patriots. Steve. Uh, surprisingly, I'll, I'll take the Patriots too. Uh, what about Kira? Patriots. As a, Patri as a Patriots fan, I'm really happy to hear that. And uh, Ilya, thank you very much for the interview. Uh, and in the end, we would like uh, to give you a small present. Oh. So, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you guys, you and your uh, three brothers, you've made Russian Front. And we've decided that the NFL needs another team. And we're going to call it Russian Front. So, we've decided jerseys for you guys. So, here it is. And uh, you guys... And you guys, as yeah. you know, yes. It's yeah, impossible so, yeah. to play with only three players. That's why um, we've decided that three of you could help your Shuk brothers to reach the Super Bowl. So, thank you. Ilya, thank you, thank thank you very much for the interview. If you want to say something in Russian to our audience. Can I great. finally do that? Yes. Yeah. Thank you guys for the, uh, for the interview. It was Tochko Persona. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now I will tell you everything. I never thought when I was young что я буду говорить на английском языке в России. Нам, нас всегда, как говорится, родители ругали, когда мы дома говорили на английском языке, чтобы не забыть русский язык. И когда я им скажу, что я когда приехал в Россию, мне сказали говорить на русском языке, то есть на английском языке, они не поверят просто. Да, большое вам спасибо и желаю вам всем счастья.